Even against immense odds, women remain catalysts for reform in Arab countries. This is a quote from our next speaker, Ahmad al Alim al Soswa. She's living proof. Ahmad al Soswa was Yemen's first female ambassador and first woman minister for human rights. She began broadcasting at the age of 10, became a TV anchor, and finally deputy TV program director at Sana'a TV, the highest ranking women in Yemeni television. She also served as Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations Development Program. She is a tireless advocate for the human rights ABD freedom of expression. Please join me in welcoming her today. Thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction. As our organizers stated in the invitations to this year's conference, the need to unite for peace educators and the communities they serve has never been greater than in this time of expanding global crisis. In thinking of the current expanding global crisis, I believe we are forced to conclude that the world is in, in fact facing a peace crisis. Some of the sovereign states that were founders of the United Nations in 1945 have during the most recent decades ignored the UN Charter's overriding purpose. It's the settlement of international disputes by peaceful means. Chapter four of the UN Charter requires peaceful settlement of international disputes and provides detailed provisions for peaceful settlements. Thinking of the terrible consequences of the armed conflicts in Ukraine, Ethiopia, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq, for example, how different would be the world if UN members have rushed in an organized way to insist upon to facilitate peaceful resolution. Instead, we have seen UN members intervene in armed conflicts, not to end them, but to extend and intensify them. Foreign states and non-state actors have directly intervened with their military forces and provided more weapons to fuel continuing conflicts. This has escalated the level of civilian casualties and the scale of destruction of objects indispensable to survival of the civilian population. Foreign interveners have greatly complicated efforts by the UN and others to negotiate an end to these conflicts. The 20th century peace infrastructure Looking back at the first decade after the establishment of the UN in 1945, there was a remarkable flourishing of cooperative activities among its member states and institutions to build new rules and institutions to implement the commitments of the Charter to preserve international peace and protect human rights even during times of armed conflict. In December 1948, the General Assembly adopted Resolution 217A, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 1953, the European Convention on Human Rights was adopted, and in 1959, its European Court of Human Rights was established. In 1948, the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man was adopted, and in 1959, it was implemented by establishment of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. In 1966, many UN member states signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. In this years, there was also great progress in international humanitarian law, the treaties that deal with the way war may be waged. 
The overriding purpose was the protection of civilians in institutions in situations of armed conflict. For example, Protocol 1, 8 June 1977 of the Geneva Convention prohibit attack on objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. This progress included establishing implementing institutions such as war crimes tribunals for the wars in the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, and more recently, the International Criminal Court. Efforts have also been made to require war makers to repair the damage done. For example, the UN Compensation Commission was established to deal with claims arising from the Iraq invasion to Kuwait. As peace educators, we must face the question of why the extensive institutional structure created in the mid 20th century has not been able to deter current armed conflicts whose national and individual perpetrators seem to feel free to ignore international legal and moral obligations. In most of our current armed conflicts, civilians have not been protected. Instead, civilians have been directly attacked by airstrikes, blockades, and destruction of objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. Starvation of the civilian population has been used as a weapon of war. Humanitarian workers and supplies have been denied access to, de to operate in civilian areas. Health facilities and workers and hospitals have been attacked Political leaders have used hate speech posing the threat of genocide. Worldwide impact the Sustainable Development Goals. As we all know, and as one also has worked for human rights and in the field of economic development, I feel particular concern that the peace crisis has undermined prospects of the entire world's progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. The world's sincere commitment to defeat poverty and hunger, improve education and health, and work for gender equality, to name just the first five SDGs con commitments, has been severely disrupted by these particularly vicious episodes of war. National and international funds needed to achieve the SDGs are being used instead to respond to humanitarian emergencies resulting from conflicts. Long-term projects for economic and social development are starved of human and financial resources. Thus, the impact of these individual armed conflicts spread current and future misery throughout the world. What must be done? The talent and the experience of those in this conference should be mobilized to analyze our current peace crisis and plan for action to confront it. Let us consider how to reform and re-energize the peace infrastructure created in the 20th century we should start by recommitting ourselves the UN Charter's mandate of peaceful settlement of international disputes and to the sustainable development goals. Perhaps each of us can consider what part we and the organizations with which we work can play. Thank you for your kind attention.